the Seventh Day Adventist. And looking at the uh, Seventh Day Adventist website, it's uh, difficult to see a lot wrong with the group. Uh, this false religion appears more than any other to be born again Christians. Uh, they outwardly teach salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone, uh, the virgin birth, the Godhead, the baptism by immersion, the deity of Christ, and so on. They fail to mention their inner church teachings that modify these doctrines, add to them, or take away from them. The problem comes in uh, when one finds uh, that Ellen G. White, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist, is uh, supposedly a prophetess uh, whose many books are considered as being on the same level as the Bible. So let's look at her background and briefly uh, and look at uh, where the Seventh-day Adventists disagree with mainstream Christianity. In the early uh, history, uh, it goes back to William Miller, who was a Baptist preacher and came to the conclusion that Christ would return to earth in 1843. Christ did not come in 1843, so he changed the date to 1844. And Christ didn't come in 1844 either, so there was nothing, uh, there was no more date sitting by Miller. Ellen Harmon, at this time, aged 17 years, uh, claimed uh, that God showed her that Jesus entered the Holy of Holies in heaven to begin the investigative judgment. And I'll explain that later. Uh, James White was one of the leaders in the Seventh-day Adventist and married Ellen Harmon in 1846. Some of the followers of Miller then formed the Seventh-day Adventist and began keeping the Sunday Sabbath. Um, one of the problems of the Seventh-day Adventist is that Ellen uh, G. White has been proven to be uh, to have copied the great controversy, which contains the key doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist theology. She did not receive it from God as a prophetess, but copied it. And since that is true, her writings are not as one uh, who is a prophet, but one who is a plagiarist. She copied this book from the ones written by James White, who copied the, from those written by John Andrews, all joint founders of the Seventh-day uh, Adventists. And then the Seventh-day Adventists, like the Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons, and others, uh, came out with their own Bible translation in 1994. It is called the Clear Word Bible, and has been changed several times since it first came out. The Bible incorporates the Adventist doctrine, which is woven into the text. It is a paraphrase that teaches uh, Adventist doctrine. There are two examples of their Bible. Uh, the change seems to be uh, endless. Uh, therefore, uh, as you listen to this video, uh, bear in mind that they're using a different Bible with the teachings of Ellen G. White and her writings from the great controversy woven in. The Bible says in Matthew 25, verse 45, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. And the clear word Bible says, I have no choice but to end your lives because in my kingdom, everyone cares about everyone else. Uh, the Bible says in Jude 1, 9, yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses and durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuked thee. And the clear word Bible says, in contrast to these ungodly men is uh, the Lord Jesus also called Michael the Archangel, for he is also the entire angel, he is over the entire angelic host when he was challenged by Satan and his intentions to resurrect Moses. He didn't come at Satan with a blistering attack, nor did he condemn him with mockery. He simply said, God rebuke you for claiming Moses' money. Seventh day Adventists, uh, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Uh, they get this from some of the writings of Ellen White, but uh, at the same time, they believe that Jesus is God. Uh, this contradicts God's word. This can be seen in Hebrews 1, verses 8 through 14, and it is clearly against Christian doctrine. Jesus, of course, is not an angel, but is the Son of God, as clearly taught in the Bible. And you can see that in our video on uh, Two Natures of Christ. And the Seventh-day Adventists uh, have certain distinctive doctrines which distinguish them from Christian churches. 
Let's begin where the problem begins, and that is with the prophecy in Ellen G. White in the 28 Fundamental Beliefs published by the Seventh-day Adventists under the 18th Belief, the Gift of Prophecy. We find the following uh, statement. It says, The scriptures testify that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church, and, it, and we believe it was manifested in, min, in the ministry of Ellen White. Her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. Okay, so that means that Ellen White's writings can be used as authoritative truths equal to God's Bible. And this, uh, this is where the Seventh-day Adventists get uh, out of the true teaching of God's Word and add to and take away from God's Word. Ellen White wrote a uh, multitude of books uh, with most changing the meaning of God's Word. The Seventh-day Adventists teach salvation by grace through faith, but then add works to grace. Grace is given to mankind, which enables the keeping of God's law and, and, uh, and to build a holy character that is fit for heaven. They call this classical Arminianism. In other words, they explain, if two men, Jim and Bob, give their hearts to Christ, they are born again and sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, pardoned of their sins, declared to be sons of God. However, only Jim makes it to heaven, while Bob ends up lost because he turned his back on Christ. Jim would make it to heaven by virtue of his faith in Christ, but Bob, having decided to turn his uh, back on Christ, would be turned away. In other words, they believe one can be lost after being saved. One of their books uh, on how to know you're saved says people can fall away from God through choice, pressure, carelessness, or inattention. Though God draws us to himself and will do everything he can, uh, can to uh, keep us close to him. He won't force us to stay, but those who, who do stay choose to uh, uh, stay close to God, uh, live happier, more confident lives than those who don't. To see that mankind cannot lose his salvation, uh, take a look at our video on losing salvation. Uh, how can one get to heaven when no sin is allowed in uh, in heaven? Um, so you need to look at our article on or our video on uh, imputation. Uh, when you've read these uh, two articles, you will see that Seventh Day Adventists are teaching God's are not teaching God's word uh, by adding to and taking away and by placing a lie between two truths. They change God's word. In Ellen G. White's book, Steps to Christ, she says, How shall a man be just with God? How shall the sinner be made righteous? It is only through Christ that we can be brought into harmony with God, with holiness. But how are we to come to Christ? Many are asking the same question as the multitude on the day of Pentecost. Uh, when convicted of sin, uh, they cried out, What shall we do? And uh, the first word of Peter's uh, answer was repent. Uh, Acts uh, chapter 2, verses uh, 37 and 38. And another time, shortly afterwards, he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. It's in Acts uh, 3, verse 19. Repentance includes sorrow for sin and turning away from it. Uh, we shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness until we turn away from it in heart and there will be no real change in life. If one was saved by grace through faith alone, as they previously stated, then one doesn't have to turn away from sin in order to be saved. Adventists say that the way to be holy and fit enough to get to heaven is to keep God's law, the Ten Commandments. Galatians 3 verses 3 through 8 tells us, that if a believer, uh, that if we believe, we will be saved. Uh, it is counted for righteousness. Then in Galatians uh, chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, we're told that no one is justified by the law. Uh, Christ was made a curse for us. We can, uh, one, we can, uh, one can see this in Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, that salvation has nothing to do with works. And... Uh, 
And in Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says, All our works are as filthy rags. Um, when, when Christ did not return in 1844, as Miller had predicted, Ellen Harmon had a vision claiming that God showed her the, uh, that Jesus entered the Holy of Holies in heaven to begin the investigative judgment, also known today as the uh, pre-advent judgment, as distinct from the final judgment. Seventh-day Adventists believe that when one dies, they rest in their graves until resurrection. So there is no necessity for any kind of a judgment uh, immediately after death. They believe that uh, when Jesus returns, he will bring his reward with him. So the judgment needs only to take place shortly prior to the second coming. Adventists state that man is made up of two parts, a body and a soul. However, the Bible teaches that man consists of three parts, a body, soul, and a spirit. You'll find that in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse uh, 23, and Hebrews 4, verse 12, Genesis 2, verse 7. And then in uh, Revelation uh, 6, verses 9 through 11, we can see that after the body is buried, the soul can sit on the throne, be tormented, thirst, talk, and pray. For information on soul slip, look again at our video on death and uh, read the section on soul sleep. Um, in the video, Why the uh, Investigative Judgment Doctrine is Sound by Mark, uh, I mean in, in the article rather, Why the Investigative Judgment is Sound by Mark Manea, he writes, if a person believes that one, salvation can be lost, and two, that God judges, and three, that souls of men sleep until the resurrection, and four, that this reward or punishment is not received until the resurrection. So first of all, salvation cannot be lost and is a false teaching, as explained in our uh, video of uh, uh, Can You Lose Salvation? Uh, next, the teaching that the bodies and souls of men sleep in the grave until Christ returns is also a false uh, teaching. Uh, then the rewards after the rapture of the believers is just that, rewards and not punishment. Punishments for sins is death, uh, referring to the second death, which is an eternal separation from God in a lake of fire. And this occurs at the end of the millennial kingdom at the great white throne judgment, uh, since neither uh, losing salvation nor slow soul sleep are true, and there is no judgment of punishments at the rapture. There can be no investigative judgment. These are not taught in the Bible. <coughs> Excuse me. Continuing uh, with the Seventh-day Adventist uh, doctrine on investigative judgment, it is taught that uh, Jesus entered the sanctuary in 1844 on his second and last phase of his atoning ministry, the investigative judgment. Seventh-day Adventists teach in at the investigative judgment, Jesus entered the Holy of Holies in 1844 to begin a review of the works and thoughts of those that have professed faith in Christ. The judgment is based on the Ten Commandments, and the character of each person will be tested by the standard of this law to determine his eternal destiny. Jesus will be sitting in the Holy of Holies, looking at each person's sins to see who repented of those sins and who did not. Sins that are not repented of will not be pardoned and blotted out of the books of the record and will be a witness against the sinner. If even uh, one sin has not been repented of, that person will not enter heaven. With, when this judgment is finished, the rapture will occur. According to Ellen White, if one does not believe this doctrine, they cannot be saved. So let's look at the truth. The investigative judgment is a Seventh-day Adventist attempt to cover the mistake they made in 1844. When Christ did not return to the earth as predicted, the Bible teaches that after Jesus died, he was resurrected and appeared to men on earth. And then Christ ascended into heaven and was and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the mediator 
for believers and is making intercession for them. The truth is that Jesus did not enter into a sanctuary in 1844. Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies in heaven immediately after he ascended into heaven. And that's in Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3, and uh, chapter 8, verse 1, chapter 9, verse 24. God's Word also teaches that uh, a believer's sins are not only uh, forgiven, but they are forgotten, never to be remembered again. So there is no need of an unbiblical investigative judgment. Uh, Hebrews uh, 8, verse 12. Then, too, a believer will never be called to judgment into judgment uh, of works to determine their salvation. John 5, verse 24, Hebrews 9, verse 28. Unlike the teaching of the Adventists, a believer can be assured of salvation, according to 1 John 5, verse 13. God is all-knowing. He knows the numbers of hairs on our head and does not need an investigative judgment to know if we are saved or not. All Christian denominations have rejected the the idea of an investigative judgment. It is an extra biblical uh, doctrine. The penalty or wages of sin is death, according to Romans 6.23. But the gift of God is eternal life. And this penalty was paid by Jesus on the cross. And since it has been paid for, there is no more condemnation. Uh, Romans uh, 8, verse 1, and... uh, 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 you can see our video on uh, law and grace, uh, uh, how, how, how are we made righteous, and, and then there are other art, uh, video on justification. Uh, in the New Testament, we have uh, Jesus Christ as our sacrifice for today, bearing our sins in his body on the cross. He was crucified for our sins, uh, or, uh, and, and our sins were this lifted up, and away from us, no longer resting upon us. Our sins were placed on Christ and taken away forever. He suffered our penalty for sins, he himself being the sin offering. Uh, Thus, the sacrifice of Christ met every claim of God's justice and holiness, forever removing our sins. We must understand that we are sinners, but our sins were paid for by Christ. And then, Uh, When we uh, uh, repent or have a change of mind about sin and God and believe in what Christ has done for us, we will have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And that according to Hebrews 9, verse 12, 1 Peter uh, 2, verse 24, and John 3, verses uh, 14 through 17. Uh, Then the Seventh-day Adventists uh, also teach that during the tribulation, there will be a persecution of Sabbath keepers as the world imposes Sunday worship on all people. Satan impersonates Jesus and declares Sunday as the Sabbath day. And the papacy is the Antichrist. Protestants are the false prophet. And the U.S. is the enforcer. And the persecution is the Great Tribulation, which ends the battle of, uh, in the Battle of Armageddon between the true believers and Sunday, key, uh, and Sunday keepers who have the mark of the beast. The Adventists will seldom mention it to those outside the church. But they believe that all people who are not of the Seventh-day Adventist churches are lost and will be annihilated. And so uh, now let's uh, look at the truth. The Adventists uh, have it all wrong again. Nowhere in God's word does it mention the Sabbath in connection with the mark of the beast. One of the reasons of the tribulation is to bring Israel back to God and was first mentioned back in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 4, verses 29 through 30. Jeremiah tells us that God will bring both the, the tribe of Israel and the tribe of Judah back into the land of their fathers to possess it. That's in uh, uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 3. It is also designed to begin in the end of to the forces of evil before the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Jeremiah adds to the description of this tribulation and says that it is a great time that none is like it, and it is a time of Jacob or Israel's trouble. But they shall be saved, according to Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Zephaniah uh, explains the tribulation as a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of waste and 
desolation in Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 through 18. So today we see the Jews coming back into the land that's prophesied in prophecy. When, tri when the tribulation begins, Israel will accept the rule of the Antichrist. The Antichrist will rule during the tribulation, but he cannot rule until there is a falling away from true Christianity first. Um, we have that falling away today, so the Antichrist could show himself at any time. The Antichrist cannot reveal himself until the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. And the Holy Spirit that dwells each believer will be taken out of the way when the believers are raptured, according to 2 Thessalonians uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 3 and 7. After three and a half years, the uh, Antichrist will be revealed as a man of sin and savagely turn against Israel. At the end of the tribulation, the Antichrist is defeated by Jesus Christ in Romans 19, I mean, Revelation 19, verse uh, 15. Uh, the devil and the true power behind the Antichrist and the false prophet are then thrown into a bottomless pit, according to Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3, where he will be bound for 1,000 years, according to Revelation uh, 8, uh, verse 3. And the Lord returns to the Mount of Olives, as he promised in Zechariah 14, 4. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists teach that the saved will spend the millennium with Jesus in heaven. Sins of those that are saved are placed on Satan, and he and his angels will be banished to the earth and wander around for the thousand years. During this time in heaven, the redeemed will judge the lost, looking at their works to determine the degrees of punishment. Here is a quote from Ellen G. White. It was seen also that while the son of offering pointed to Christ as a sacrifice and the high priest represented Christ as a mediator, the scapegoat typified Satan, the author of sin, upon whom the sins of, of the truly penitent will finally be placed. And that's in the great uh, controversy in, uh, on page 422. But the truth, what is the truth? After the second coming of Christ and the judgment of the nations, the millennial reign begins, and we find that God is ruling over the earth and in the person of Jesus Christ. His rule was prophesied by Isaiah in Isaiah 9, uh, verses 6 through 7. Uh, Luke said that he would reign over the house of Jacob or Israel forever, and of his kingdom there would be no end, according to Luke 1, 31 through 33. So the Jews today are gathering back into the land of Israel the land today called Palestine. The Jews have occupied this land continuously for about 3,000 years. In an effort to erase any reference to the land of Israel, the Romans in 135 AD changed the name to Palestine. At this time, they will receive all the land promised, which is about eight times as large as they have ever occupied. It stretches from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates River, and southwest of the uh, river of Egypt, the, the Nile. And that's uh, according to Genesis 15, verse 18, and Ezekiel 48, verses 1 through 23. Jesus the King rules in righteousness with a rod of iron, and there is universal knowledge of him throughout the world. <clears throat> with the uh, thousand years of the millennial uh, kingdom coming to an end, Satan will be released from that bottomless pit. He will go out to deceive the nations and to gather them to battle against the saints of the believers, according to Revelation 20, verses 7 through 8. Uh, the children that have been born during this time have not all come to know the Lord as their Savior. And these are uh, that are lost will follow Satan. And they surround the saints in the city of Jerusalem. And when God sends fire down from heaven and destroys them, uh, according to Revelation 20, verse 9. Satan is then thrown into the lake of fire where he will be tormented forever, according to Revelation 20, verse 10. As, uh, as it can be seen, Jesus is not in heaven during the millennium, as taught by the seven-day Adventists. The people uh, entering into the millennial kingdom are those that are saved and alive after the judgment of the nations. There will be many during the millennial reign of Christ that will reject him. And these are the ones that come up against the saints with Satan at the end of the millennium. Uh, keep in mind that uh, all the lost are now dead uh, with soul and spirit in hell. And those at the end of the millennial reign of Christ 
will be killed by fire. And these are the lost, and they are resurrected to appear at the great white throne judgment. So, uh, again, the Seventh-day Adventists teach, uh, at the second coming of Christ, everyone's fate will already have been determined at the investigative judgment. When the millennium ends, Jesus returns to earth with a redeemed and will descend inside the new Jerusalem. Uh, Jesus will raise the wicked from the dead, and Satan will cause these to revolt against Jesus and his saints, and they will come against the new Jerusalem, and fire will engulf the earth, while the redeemed are protected inside the new Jerusalem. The wicked will then be thrown into the lake of fire and will experience degrees of punishment be annihilated. So what is the truth? <clears throat> If you're a Christian, uh, you, you have probably noticed that the Adventists have the end times out of order. However, we are only taking a look at their teaching of some of the end time events. And this teaching of the second coming is not biblical. Nowhere does the Bible mention that anyone will come up against New Jerusalem. After the thousand years, Satan is released and goes out to deceive the nations and gathers them together to do battle. Then, when they have accomplished the camp of the saints, uh, uh, fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. This is all happening at the end of the millennium and not during the second coming, according to Revelation 20, verses 7 through 10. The second coming of Christ is uh, predicted in the Old Testament. Uh, Moses, writing in Deuteronomy uh, concerning the Jewish people, says that uh, Jehovah, Israel's God, will turn their captivity and gather them from all people where he had scattered them. So today, God has regathered Israel into their land, and they have been recognized as the nation of Israel since 1948. God promised to judge Israel's enemies and bless Israel abundantly. Deuteronomy 30, verses 1 through 9. Here are a few more Old Testament references speaking of the second coming and the millennial kingdom if you would like them. It's Psalms 2, verses 1 through 12, Psalms 24, verses 1 through 10, Psalms 110, verses uh, 1 through 7, and Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 16. The second coming will be uh, an event that is clearly visible to everyone on earth. It will follow the rapture and the tribulation. Christ will return with his church and establish the millennial kingdom on earth in Mark 14, verses 61 and 62. Jesus in these verses not only claimed to be the Messiah, but also claimed he was equal to God. The Jewish leaders uh, knew the Old Testament prophecies of the coming Messiah and his kingdom. Jesus was referring to Psalms 110, verses 1 through 7, an Old Testament prophecy of the millennial kingdom. Uh, when he comes, he will, with his church, uh, uh, to judge his enemies and to punish the nations, and he will set up his kingdom. When Jesus told the high priest in Mark uh, 14, verse 62, that he would see the Son of Man coming back on clouds of heaven, he was telling the priest that he was the eternal ruler foretold by prophet Daniel in Daniel 7, uh, verses uh, 13 through 14. The uh, kingdom of uh, Jesus Christ uh, will set up, it is eternal and will never be destroyed. Uh, some groups will say that this is symbolic and use their allegorical or spiritual interpretation uh, or method of interpreting the Bible, uh, which, which is a false method. However, the second coming of Christ to set up his kingdom is a literal, visible, and bodily return of Jesus Christ to the earth in which everyone will see him, according to Mark 13, verses 26 through 27. And this second coming will be a sad time for most people, a time of mourning, says Matthew, because they have rejected Christ, and the angels now begin to separate the lost from the believers, in Matthew 24, verses 30 through 31, and Revelation 1, verses 7 through 8. There are many more doctrines and problems that could be mentioned, but I believe these are enough uh, for anyone to decide whether the Seventh-day Adventists are a cult. Regardless, it has teachings that are not biblical and should be avoided, and they have added to, changed, and taken away from God's Word, which is 
forbidden in Revelation 22, verses 18 through 19, and other places. And again, I thank you for listening.